Erica Green was just a three-year-old little girl who tragically passed away due to the neglect of her own parents, due to the nature of the disposal of Erica's body, and the fact that her parents never alerted authorities about their daughter's disappearance, it would take investigators four years to officially identify her. So what really happened to Erica Green? I'm going to take a deep dive into the events of her life up until the day she passed away. As well, I will discuss the autopsy reports regarding her cause of death. Erica Michelle Mary Green was born on May 15, 1997 in McLeod, Potawatomi County, Oklahoma, USA. Her mother, Michelle Johnson, gave birth to her at the Children's Hospital at OU Medical Center in Oklahoma City under correction supervision. And within 24 hours, Erica was given to Betty Brown, who would become her foster mother. Betty was Erica's guardian until Michelle was released from prison. Erica loved to watch the Teletubbies and Blue's Clues, and to Betty, Erica carried herself independently. At times, Erica called Betty Granny. One day, Michelle asked Betty permission to take Erica to a family reunion, which she allowed. On April 4, 2001, Betty made Erica breakfast. They talked and watched TV together. When Erica was leaving, she said, Bye, I'll be back. And that was the last time she saw her alive. Little Erica was unaware of the evil that would come her way as soon as she left the care of her foster mother. After arriving at her mom and stepdad's house, that was when the abuse began. According to Lawanda Driscoll, the cousin of Harold, and whose house it was where Erica died in, Erica would be beaten regularly. And due to the fact that Erica became homesick and would cry often, it would aggravate her stepdad, Harold Johnson. Harold would beat her for anything, like if she cried or peed on herself, or if she vomited due to the intensity of the beatings, if she wouldn't eat, and more. Although Driscoll witnessed the beatings, she didn't even get involved or try to stop them because in her mind, it was none of her business. She did tell Michelle to tell Harrell to ease up on the beatings, but of course he didn't pay her any mind. These regular beatings eventually led up to Erica's murder. On April 2001, the family got home around 8 or 9 p.m. After getting home, Michelle saw Harrell and Erica standing in the bedroom. And according to Michelle, Harrell was high on PCP and alcohol. Michelle told Erica to go to bed and then left the room to take a bath. According to Harrell, he deemed Erica as being disrespectful because she was disobeying the request for her to go to sleep. And after telling Erica to go to bed five or six times, he got agitated. When Michelle walked back into the room, she saw Erica standing and asked Harrell why she was standing. He said it was because he told her to stand up. Michelle didn't like that and basically told Harrell to worry about his own baby. Me and the six-month-old Markeisha. Michelle then told Erica to lie down. Michelle at this point was sitting on the bed while Erica was standing a few feet from her, with Harrell behind her. According to Michelle, Harrell raised his foot up and kicked Erica in the head. Erica dropped to the floor and immediately lost consciousness. Michelle picked up the unconscious Erica and took her to the bathroom. In order to wake her up, Michelle put Erica in cold water, but she was unresponsive. She didn't move any of her limbs and her eyes were rolled back into her head. Michelle was of course aware that Erica desperately needed medical attention and even though she tried her hardest to wake her up, 10 or 15 minutes later, Michelle took Erica back into the bedroom and laid her on the floor. Erica was still unconscious. Harrell and Michelle knew very well that Erica needed medical attention, yet they didn't seek any help, all because they both had outstanding warrants. You see, Harrell hadn't paid a $10,000 bond on an assault charge. Apparently, he struck a man over the head with a brick. 
he was also wanted on a shooting charge. They were afraid that if they got Erica the medical attention she needed, police would find out that they had active warrants and would arrest them. So, they were basically being selfish and considered what's best for them and not what was best in the interest of the child. For the next 10 to 14 hours, Erica was still unconscious. The next day, Michelle and Harrell tried to feed Erica. Not sure how that would work with her being unconscious, but Erica passed away without ever waking up. After Erica passed away, Harrell and Michelle decided to dispose of her body. They waited until it was dark and then took her body out through a window of the house. Although it was said that Harrell and Michelle both went out through the window in order to not be detected by his cousin, they may have actually went out through the front door. You see, Driscoll mentioned that she witnessed both Harrell and Michelle leaving with a stroller with Erica inside of it, looking like she was asleep. And during that encounter, Michelle told Driscoll that she was taking Erica back to her foster mother. So, there were two different stories regarding how Michelle and Harrell left the home with Erica's deceased body. They took hedge clippers along with Erica's body to a close-by wooded area. Harrell then removed Erica's clothes and gave them to Michelle. And that was when Harrell severed Erica's head with the hedge clippers, put the head inside two garbage bags, and discarded the head into a dumpster at a church of all places. Harrell then left Erica's nude, decapitated body in the woods. Even though Harrell put the head in the church's dumpster, Michelle became concerned about the odor because the smell may alert churchgoers or anyone walking nearby. So she convinced Harrell to discard the head in a wooded area nearby the body instead. Afterwards, they both returned home. The next day, Harrell's cousin was asking for Erica since she hadn't seen her. Michelle told her that Betty Brown had picked up Erica and taken her back to Oklahoma. And to the cousin, this wasn't anything to question since Erica was living with Betty since she was born. In the evening of April 28, 2001, an officer discovered Erica's body in the woods. And even though the police searched the woods nearby the body, they didn't find her head. But then on May 1st, 2001, her head was discovered in a garbage bag in the wooded area. After that, police started their investigation to find out the identity of the child. Understandably, police assumed that this child would have been reported missing by their parents, so there would have been a missing persons file that they could look into. But strangely to them, Erica was never reported missing, and so she was known in the community and the media as Precious Doe. For over four years, police maintained their search for the identity of the deceased child. And one of the ways authorities tried to generate leads to her identity was by reconstructing her head digitally and by using clay since her head was badly decomposed. And during this time, Michelle and Harrell moved from place to place. If someone were to ask them where Erica was, they would just say that she's currently living with another relative. Even though the news reported on Precious Doe numerous times, they never came forward with the truth. There was a point where Harrell's grandfather called them on their bullshit and accused them of killing Erica, since no one in the family has seen or heard of Erica. Harrell kind of came clean and disclosed that Erica had in fact died, but that her death was an accident. This confession was good enough for the grandfather to contact authorities in regards to Erica. So on April 30th, 2005, authorities got a tip about the child's identity. And on May 3rd, 2005, officers visited Muskogee, Oklahoma. And on the morning of May 4th, 2005, they had a conversation with Harrell's grandfather, who told officers, that he wanted people to know the truth about who Precious Doe was before he should die. And he then ID'd Precious Doe as Erica Green. At the time, both Harrell and Michelle were arrested based on some warrants and they were at Muskogee County Jail. And that was where police started to question them. When questioning Michelle, 
the police displayed a picture of Erica, which Michelle identified. And on the back of the picture, there was writing which said, Mama is so sorry. You are always in my heart and soul. Love you always, little E. Michelle then agreed to tell the cops everything. After she made her statement, she was able to meet with Harrell. She then told him that it was over, that she had come clean, and that he should do the same. Harrell began crying and told Michelle that he was going to do the right thing to get her off. Harrell then agreed to do a verbal and video recorded statement, discussing how he kicked Erica, didn't provide her with medical attention, disconnected her head, and disposed of her body and head in the woods. He also ID'd Erica from a picture, and on the back of the picture he wrote, I'm so sorry that this happened, and I hope that you forgive me for what I've done, and I will always love you with my heart and soul, Harrell Laron Johnson. I will always miss you, Harrell Johnson. When it comes to the autopsy, it showed that Erica had been inflicted with numerous injuries to her head. There were some oval-shaped defects and some slit-like defects in many places of her scalp and face. In the frontal scalp, on the top of her head, on the back of the head, and in the right temporal place, there was hemorrhaging. And in the right temporal place, there were also areas of injury from blunt impact. The skull was still together, but inside of it, there was a small amount of a blood clot and a large areas of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The small blood clot indicates that there was an injury to the brain where the brain is moving fast and stopping within the inside of the skull. Based on the forensic pathologist who did the autopsy, the small blood clot and the subarachnoid hemorrhage were caused by closed head injury or blunt force head injury. The pathologist said that the injuries he discovered on Erica's head were consistent with an act of severe kicking. He made sure to note that the head had many points of impact on different areas. The forensic pathologist says, we have a situation in which there are areas of deep scalp injury that are on the front of the head. They're on the top of the head, they're in the back of the head, and they're also in the right temple part of the head. These are areas that are just not simply on one surface, but there are areas of impact on multiple different surfaces indicating more than one impact. Even though the kicks that were made by the victim's stepdad made Erica unconscious for at least 10 hours, what ultimately killed her was the fact that Harrell and Michelle never got her the medical attention she needed. On September 29th, 2008, Harrell was charged with murder in the first degree, endangering the welfare of a child in the first degree, and abuse of a child resulting in death. There was a trial, and the jury found him guilty for all three offenses. During sentencing, Harrell claimed that he did not receive a fair trial, and also made sure to note that he did not kill little Erica. You know, you people don't know me. You just know what these people then cooked up and what I was forced to say, that's all you know. But never once have I harmed a hair on her head or did anything to hurt her. Johnson was sentenced to life in prison without probation or parole for murder in the first degree, four years imprisonment for endangering the welfare of a child, and 25 years imprisonment for child abuse resulting in death. He was ordered to serve them consecutively. Harrell attempted to appeal the sentence, which was ultimately denied. Michelle pled guilty to second degree murder and also was sentenced to 25 years in prison after testifying against her husband. Although it was a guilty verdict, Betty Brown still felt a sense of loss when it came to the murder of Erica Green. Still be there. The feelings will be there. For me. The missing of her and everything. Not knowing where she was at the time. It went so long. Erica Green's death didn't have to happen and could easily have been prevented. In my opinion, 
The cousin of Harrell should have done more to protect little Erica. As an adult, she has a duty to report the abuse of a child, which she didn't. The child died in her own home, and she supposedly wasn't aware of it. I believe that she too should have been charged with something because she was aware and witnessed the pain and abuse that her cousin inflicted on Erica. I believe the reason why she didn't do more was because she didn't want her cousin to go back to jail where he definitely belongs. I mean, she was always aware of how much of a violent man her cousin can be and his warrants reinforced that idea. Also, from the time Harrell kicked Erica in the head, he should have immediately brought her to the hospital and maybe then Erica would still be alive and he wouldn't have to go to jail for the rest of his life for a first degree murder. As I mentioned, children need to be protected and loved. And as adults, we should be able to make smart decisions on the welfare of the child. If Erica was still alive, she would be my age, 24, 25, and she would have been able to experience high school, first love, first breakup, going to college, getting her first job, etc. But due to the selfishness of her parents, she will never be able to do any of those things, ever. If you or anyone has ever witnessed child abuse in any shape or form, please don't be afraid to speak out because you never know, you may save a child's life. Thank you for watching this video and let me know what you think about this case. Do you agree that her death was preventable? Do you also agree that Harrell's cousin should have done more and should also face some type of punishment for Erica's murder? Please comment down below your opinions on this case. As well, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my channel if you want, and I will see you next time on Melanin Mysteries.